Have you written a book and want to get it published? Then now's the time to call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099 and do it immediately. You see, they're looking for authors of all types of books. And unlike most publishers, Page Publishing will take the time to review most of the books submitted to them. And they'll even give you their feedback. And if they like what they read, Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, the Apple iTunes Store, and other outlets. They'll handle everything. Copyright protection, printing, cover art, publicity, and editing. So if you've written a novel, a children's book, a cookbook, inspirational work, a book of poetry, or biography, and want to get it published, then you need to call Page Publishing and do it immediately. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. Your road to fame and fortune could very well start with this simple phone call. For your free author submission kit, call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm your host, Alice Stockton Rossini. Thanks for joining the club tonight. This is the place to come if you've written a book you haven't published yet, or if you've been thinking of writing a book and you just don't know where or how to get started. Every week, first time authors and longtime authors talk about their process, their roadblocks, and the things in life that propelled them into action. Guaranteed, you will hear someone who sounds just like you, except they've published a book and you haven't. We begin tonight with two authors who wanted to write so they could give back. On the line we have Lisa Gies, and the name of your book is Croakersville. Yes, it is. It's got to be a children's book. It is. All right. What's it about? Well, I have a pond next door to my house here that uh, I realized one night as I go to sleep, I listen to the frogs. And I hear them croaking every night, and uh, I just went and built that, built the story around the, um, around the pond, where a little boy finds an imaginary, or he's not sure if it's imaginary or not, a uh, village of frogs where they go shopping, and there's different stores there, and the frogs sing at night, and uh, then the then the uh, we have a dry spell and the pond dries up there, which makes him question whether it's real or not. And eventually, we get the rains that the uh, pond comes back and the frogs come back louder and stronger. This is a seasonal thing, right? Yes and no. I mean, it, it is a summer, early fall type thing. By the by, the middle of the fall, the frogs have uh, have left for the summer. So yeah, I would say it's seasonal. Did the story come to you as you were laying in bed one night listening to the croaks? I believe so. I just kind of started going with it. Um, You know, I just started coming up with these little things. And the more I looked at the pond when I took my dog out for a walk or went chasing the bears in the neighborhood, I uh, just built on that. And I, I could actually stand at the pond now and visualize the book next to the pond. Do you have any children? No, we don't. Oh, but you but there's a little boy in this story. Yes. Who sees all this? Yes, there is. Any music? I hear music on this one. Nope. <laughs> the music of the croaking. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, they do sing, you know, every night uh after they're done splashing and and having fun in their pond there, they all gather to they all gather together with the crickets. You hear the crickets and you hear the frogs and uh, the fireflies are providing the light for them. And uh, they they do croak. Uh, When I get home from work at 12 o'clock and I go to bed, I still hear them croaking. What's the takeaway here from this? Or little kids, what are they learning? I think that they're learning that you can you can imagine anything. This may this may not be real, but if you imagine something. It's it's like the start of your dreams, because that that's what I what I feel is I imagine the story, and then putting it on paper and then following through and having it published. That was like my imagination following is starting, being the start of my dream. And I think that if children can imagine, then they can build their dreams off those imaginations. And maybe those dreams will come true, right? Exactly. How did you find Paige? Actually, uh, through my hometown newspaper on Long Island, um, (laughs) I look at it online on the computer, and I saw a woman from two towns over where I grew up who actually had published a book recently with Paige. 
she was doing publicity for her book? Yes. Yeah, they had done a, um, a press release in the local paper for her book, and there was a picture of her and her book and the name of the company. And I said, wow, let me try that one. And that's where I got involved with them. How was your experience? It has been absolutely awesome. Um, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, Tom and Steve over at Page last week, um, and they are fabulous. But the person I give absolute kudos to is Nicole, who's been my guidance through through this whole process. She has been so accommodating, so patient, so helpful. I just can't say enough about her. What are you doing to get your book out there? I'm trying to to get the final glitches taken out of it. And then um, I already have done a lot of word of mouth. I hope to do some uh, book signings here in in the Poconos. And um, I'm going to be donating one of my copies to a school uh, for a child that I used to take care of who had passed away. So I'm going to donate that to the school in his honor or in his memory. That's wonderful. And, uh, yeah, I'm just, it's going to be a lot of word of mouth. We'll see what's happening you know, out and about here. But like I said, I hope to do some book signings nearby. And uh, so far the response has been uh, really good. I've been able to show some people the book, and everybody wants a copy. And if everybody wants a copy, Lisa, that's a pretty good sign. Thanks so much for joining us. Our next author, Marilyn Mastbaum, wrote The Second Adoption. This is an autobiography about the horrors of being adopted by foster parents, finding family, and through faith, Finding a way to let go. Yes, ma'am. I have an older brother and sister. We were all three put out for adoption. It was during the Depression. So you never knew your parents? No. And you wound up in a foster home? It was a foundling home in Indianapolis, Indiana, during the 30s. So this is about all they had back then. And then you were adopted when you were just over a year old. And how did your siblings find you? Uh, For my adopted mother passed away, I got a hold of some things that had all the information on it. And I tried to reach them, couldn't find them, but they found me after I moved to Florida. That was in 1996. So what was that like? That was the first time I couldn't talk. I was speechless, totally speechless from the shock. I bet meeting your brother and sister for the first time must have been unbelievable. So, okay, and then you decided that you would write this book about what it was like with your foster parents. Well, the type of home I grew up in... Uh, mother and father, neither one could show love for each other, so therefore there was no love in the home. And I ran away when I was 19, and I on my own. Got into a lot of things that I shouldn't have gotten into, but nobody to guide me. So after two children, I finally got myself straightened up. Then I met my second husband, and we were married next year. We would have been married 50 years. And it was second time around for both of us. That's great that you could have a happy marriage after all you went through. So, okay, what made you write the book? Um, I had to do something. I had so much hatred and disappointment and bitterness in my life, and I couldn't get rid of it. And I had come down to Florida to visit my daughter and took a test to get a job. And I didn't know how to use a computer at that time. And I thought, that's ridiculous. So I went back home, took a computer course at um, Ivy Tech, and got good grades on that. And the teacher said, just start writing something so you get used to it. And that's when my book started. So the first thing that you did when you learned to use a computer was write a book? Yes, ma'am. I tried typing it on a typewriter, tried doing it so my daughter could write it down. Nothing worked. But when I could see it on the screen, then tears flowed, and I was able to release. So the next step was? Getting published? I had this was the second time I'd tried to have it published. The first time it was turned down and that was about ten years ago. But this time I thought, Well, I'll send it and see what they say and they said, Send it please. We've seen a lot of adoption stories, but none like yours. Marilyn, that's great. What what is it that you want people to take away from your book? I it's done so that people who are going through things they think they can get no help with can say, yes, you can get rid of that bondage. You don't have to keep that junk in your system. It was not a good home. I also tried to kill my adopted father, so uh, it just had to all come out and get rid of. 
And writing it down was enough? You didn't need, you know, a shrink or, you know, some kind of psychological help? No, no. I'm a born again Christian. I don't believe in psychiatrists. <laughs> and then uh, I started writing and completed it. It took me 10 years to write, but I got it all out. Have you had people read your book? Have you gotten feedback? Yes, because I used to have it just printed by a printing shop, and I handed it out that way. And it's gone over a lot of places, but it just wasn't going far enough out to cover the people out there that need the help. That was the main reason for me writing it. Whatever I make on the book goes to missions at my church. I'm not keeping a dime of it. Very nice, Marilyn. Very thoughtful. Next up, David Shearer. He's an anesthesiologist. He's written books, but mostly medical books. This is a book about his search for a woman who meant the world to him. It's called The House of Black and White, My Life and Search for Louise Johnson Morris. Tell us about your book, David. Well, my book is a memoir about growing up in the suburbs of D.C. and rediscovering my childhood caretaker after a 31-year absence between us. What happened to her? Well, she left our family's employment in 1981 after working with us for 22 years and basically being like a mom to us kids. And um, I was in med school at the time, and so I discovered she left the family over mysterious circumstances, and it wasn't until 2012 I discovered she was alive and living in Macon, Georgia, her hometown at the age of 90. So I went down to see her. What was that like? It was unbelievable. It was, I flew down on Martin Luther King weekend uh, in January of 2012 to the nursing home where she was in Macon, Georgia. I brought some presents for her and a bunch of childhood photographs of all of us when we were kids from 40 years before. And there she was in a wheelchair and kind of debilitated, but we made the connection and I met all her family and all her um, people down there and the saw the places she would tell me about from decades before, and um, it was amazing. Did you ever find out what the controversy was, like why why she left? No, there was a controversy. My mom claims that she was stealing from the family, which I don't believe, and Louisa's son claims later on that it's because my parents wouldn't give her a raise. So it doesn't really matter to me what the truth is. She was still the greatest thing in the world, so... Um, I never knew the real reason why. It could be part of both, but um, when I was in my mid-50s, I decided I've had enough waiting. I'm going to see if she's alive. So I did some search engine stuff, and I found her son, finally, in Baltimore, and I called the number. No answer. So I went up myself and knocked on his door. No answer. Hadn't seen the guy in 45 years, so I slipped a note in the mailbox, and that night he called me, told me she was alive. I caught her just in time. She died three months later at the age of 90, and I was an honored speaker at her funeral. I was uh, welcomed as family. I, I spoke at her funeral. I caught her just in time before she died. Were you devastated by that? Uh, I was not devastated because I knew that I finally found her and that she lived a full life, and she lived to be a healthy lady relatively until she was 90. So I was very satisfied and pleased that I found this great person, you know, and um, and that I that I finally made the connection. From the earliest memory I had, you know, being less than two, um, I had a black woman, a white woman, and a white dad. So I had two Jews and a Christian black woman as my three parents. So what's what's your message, David? Never give up on trying to find someone or connecting with somebody who meant something to them. That even if distance or time separates people or the fact that you don't want to stir up old waters. If you want to contact somebody bad enough who is important to you, life is short. You better go do it. That's the takeaway message. Because I don't care if it's an old teacher, an old lover, uh, an old family member, uh, someone who guided you, a clergy person, whatever, a rabbi, whatever. If that person's important to you, don't waste time, because they could die, and so can you. Oh, David, that is so true. How many times do you think about someone who made a difference in your life, and you're thinking about them, and you're thinking about them, and you're thinking, you know, I should really reach out to them, and you don't. And the next thing you know, it's too late. Don't do that. 
None of us should do that. All right, we have got to take a quick break. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Don't go anywhere. Attention all authors. Page Publishing is looking for authors. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, Apple iTunes, and other outlets. They handle all aspects of the publishing process for you. Printing, cover art, publicity, copyright, and editing. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. That's 800-204-6099 for your free author submission kit. Welcome back to the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm your host, Alice Stockton Rossini. Our next author has been writing since she was a teenager. All she needed was a little time, and when she finally got some, she made the best of it. Barbara Lamping wrote Mist Woman. Tell us about it, Barbara. It's a love story adventure about a young Indian shaman who's having dreams of this, of Mist Woman. She is like a Mother Nature creator spirit. He sees this woman, and he has this overwhelming urge to try to find her. And uh, then on the other side of this mountain, there is this very lonely young woman who is living alone with all of these critters as her friends. Fate kind of draws them together, and he realizes that she's the girl in his dream. They've been drawn together and kind of like destined to meet, and then their lives are... uh, kind of tumultuous, even there are parts that are very romantic and very loving and touching with a lot of really nice characters involved in their life. And then, uh, of course, like all true life stories, they have to go through some tragedy and heartache as well. But in the end, they kind of are destined to save his people and lead them to a place of sanctuary. What led you to this? I've done a lot of reading, and I love adventure, romance. It just was um, a story that that was inside of me that just kind of needed to come out. Was this a story that you'd been thinking about for a long time? Yeah, for about the past four years. Though once I started writing the story, it took me less than a year to complete it because it just kind of flowed out of me. So you needed to get this out? Yes, yes. What propelled you to do that, to finally sit down and do it? I had the time. I would get things down on paper, but uh, now that my kids are out of the house and, and I love Empty Nest, it gives me lots of time to, to do what I love to do. That's funny you should say you love Empty Nest because it's hard for a lot of women. <laughs> they, they, you know, the nest is empty and they don't know what to do with themselves. Well, it's, I was always so too busy to do what I really love to do. And uh, though being a caretaker and a nurse is fine, but I really wanted to explore my writing talents, and and the story has a lot of uh, personal components to it that I've added to it, so that it's even though it takes place in you know in a historical type setting, um, and in a fictional setting, it it still has a lot of uh, aspects about it that are me. And even my mother read it, and she she was saying she says I can see a lot of you in this book. Like what? The loneliness, I grew up an only child, and I love animals, and so that part is is me, as well as some of the violent parts in there with regards to, you know, suffering through abuse and things like that. I've done that, and this character is is very triumphant. It's kind of of nice. Plus, I could, it was exciting to paint the picture of, of my, quote, ideal hero, had you written before? I have uh, written several things. Um, I started writing when I was a teenager. Back then, I was writing romance and, and science fiction, so um, I had all kinds of journals and things like that. But uh, never got a chance to get those published because uh, years back I had a house fire and I lost them. So uh, these things are that I'm writing now are are more current and a lot more, I think, well-developed than when I wrote them as a teenager. What was your search for a publisher like? Oh, there were a lot of different uh, publishers out there. It was a bit confusing and stuff, but when I finally found Paige, they they just filled all my needs, so it was wonderful. How are they they different? 
I think the fact that they keep in, in constant communication with me, um, I can talk to them anytime I need to, either by computer or phone. Um, they've given me a lot of helpful hints and guidelines, and so I really like them. Have you gotten feedback on your book? Have you been able to talk to people who've read it? Oh, yes. One girl said she said, just loved it, and she said, it's, it's epic. And uh, another girl came and, and told me, she said, I just loved it. She says, I went back to uh, Barnes & Noble and, and gave them a 10 out of 10 review. And and then she asked me when the next book was coming out. So, Well, are you going to write any more books? Oh, yes. Yeah, I've got uh, the sequel um, to Mist Woman called Thunderheart is uh, all about 90% completed. And I'm hoping to get it out after Christmas. Then I've got another idea for a uh, kind of a, a futuristic, post-apocalyptic, set 500 years in the future from Mist Woman as to how the Indian ways, or quote, the old ways, are uh, actually good ways and are able to help uh, mankind survive if they would just listen. Have you had any personal experience with Indians? Have you gone to reservations, or is it just through your research? Oh, through my research, but um, I'm of Native American heritage myself. I chose um, a Plains tribe, uh, the Cheyennes, for my book and the people that I've based my books on because they were a very classic Plains Indian, and that's the way most people see Ameri- you know, Native Americans. And when they think of Indians, they think of the ones that you know, rode the plains with the buffaloes and things like that. Whereas I'm of uh, Cherokee, Chickasaw background and uh, lived in cabins and not teepees and, and uh, clothes made of cotton and, you know, and we were farmers. And so my people lived so much like the whites that came over to this country that we just kind of blended in. They're lucky to have you telling their story. I enjoy it. I really do. And like I said, it needs to be told. Thanks, Barbara. And last but not least, Sylvia Stachora wrote A Precious Commodity. Sylvia, what are you talking about when you say a precious commodity? Well, um, it it has to do with the thrust of the book. Um, My book is about a difficult emotional struggle of a man's conscience uh, to make a choice between life and the endangerment of his family and his other choice is death and the end of a magnificent discovery that would change the face of the pharmaceutical industry. And that's the primary thrust of my novel. And there is a conspiracy, and um, the granddaughter's life is threatened. There's a murder. Um, There's some passion. (laughs) Wow. None of this is true. No. So what inspired you? Uh, Well, my career working in hospitals inspired me. I worked um, in the nationally known Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo, New York, and I received an orientation and training in the cancer disease process and also the treatments that were available. I have a position as data coordinator on a a nutritional study of cancer patients that who had a laryngectomy, their voice boxes were removed. And then I also worked at the Buffalo General Hospital as an administrative secretary for three cardiologists. So based on all that experience, you were able to come up with this idea. Yes. It's a medical mystery. So, um, you know, it's entertainment mostly. Okay. All right. And you laugh, you cry, you love, you lose. Right. All those. (laughs) (laughs) What kind of feedback have you gotten? Well, um, the avid readers weren't able to put it down, and um, they loved it. Uh, some uh, were became angry at the protagonist for what he had done. Some uh, felt sad because of uh, other circumstances, um, and uh, some were a little bit shocked at uh, what had happened, uh, that the protagonist uh, had an affair. And that happened in um, Paris. That's where uh, the company expanded to Paris. The uh, book cover uh, has uh, the Eiffel Tower on it. What are you doing to get it out there? Are you going to your former places of business and doing book signings? I am going to have a book signing in November.
Yes. Where? At the library here. They welcomed you with open arms. Oh, yes, yes, a local author, yes. Mm -hmm. I think some people are reluctant to do that. You know, they're afraid they'll get rejected, but I think generally speaking, my mom's on a library board. They love it when somebody local writes a book and comes in and talks about the process and stuff. Yes, that was her reaction uh, to it. It was the manager, you know, of that particular library. So how did you end up with Paige? I wrote the book uh, several years ago, and then just really put it down. And then I decided, well, maybe I should do something with it. And so then I was contacting various publishers. And then finally I came across Page Publishing. And uh, well, I guess they had a board that uh, read my book. And then they decided that it was, a, you know, it was good to publish. And uh, I've worked with them. And uh, it was a good experience. I mean, you basically had the book done. What else needed to be done? Well, they did the uh, editing process, and they got the ISBN number. Uh, they formatted it for me, um, and it, it comes in an ebook and a hardcover. Good. So they've done all of that for me. I wouldn't have been able to do it myself. I, uh, I don't know. It would have been a difficult process. But they were very good about it, and they, you know, they were contacting me, letting me know what was going on. Do you have any advice for people like yourself who want to publish a book? Well, I think that uh, you need to have a love for writing. And as I did, I took writer's workshops and attended conferences. But I also uh, write what, should write what you know and love and keep writing. The more you write, the better you become, as with anything in life. Write and write some more. Right. <laughs> Correct. Some good advice there, Sylvia. I mean, number one, do not be afraid or reluctant to go to your local library and tell them you wrote a book. You're a published author. You want to talk about it. You want to do a book signing. And I would bet you that nine times out of ten, they are going to embrace you. They are going to promote you, and you will sell some books. Or at the very least, you're going to get people talking about the new author in town who uh, just got published. And no doubt, word of mouth is the best publicity you can ask for anyway. Also, Sylvia talked about going to writers' groups and seminars. If you have the time, you might have to spend a little money, but that is a great way to get in the same room with people who want to write and who can talk to you face-to-face -face about the obstacles they faced and how they overcame them. So this is what the Page Publishing Book Club is all about, except you're not in the same room, but we are on the same frequency, 710 WOR, every Saturday night at midnight. That's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks to Rob, my trusty engineer. He makes us all sound better. To Stephen Matthews, the man who started Page Publishing, and there wouldn't be a Page Publishing Book Club without our authors who've Visit us every week. Come back next week for another edition of the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm your host, Alice Stockton Rossini. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Then now's the time to call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099 and do it immediately. You see, they're looking for authors of all types of books. And unlike most publishers, Page Publishing will take the time to review most of the books submitted to them. And they'll even give you their feedback. And if they like what they read, Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, the Apple iTunes Store, and other outlets. They'll handle everything. Copyright protection printing, cover art, publicity, and editing. So if you've written a novel, a children's book, a cookbook, inspirational work, a book of poetry, or biography, and want to get it published, then you need to call Page Publishing and do it immediately. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. Your road to fame and fortune could very well start with this simple phone call. For your free author submission kit, call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099.